But yeah. if you if you want to say a little bit about yourself first, that would be quite great. Um, so because I know you are a writer and you also call yourself a shamanic explorer. I know you have written about 20 books by now. Um, you, from what I know about you, uh, you have a unique integrity as so much uh, what you write about comes really from experience. Um, and it always feels to me when I read anything you write that you you have a unique ability to bring together uh, the experiences with concepts, with, with the bigger picture, with the, um, and, and frame it within a bigger few of things. So, I mean, for me, that feels quite unique. And just if you tell us a little bit about you before we go into uh, the subject of, of sacredness and of uh, your experiences with the medicine and so on. Sure, yeah, and I'll bless you for those good words. I very much appreciate that for, for starters. I do call myself an author, editor, and shamanic explorer. For me, everything that I put out, um, I consider to be an offering. So what that means for me is here it is, and you can take it or leave it. I, I don't care, I'm not attached to it, but I do feel strongly that I have a message. And I appreciate what you uh, said about integrity because that has become the most important thing for me. My whole life has been uh, a search for truth. Yeah. And, uh, you know, and there's subjectivity to that, obviously, but I find myself more and more embracing what I like to call cosmic truths um, that are bigger things. And so I now don't get wrapped up in the polarities. I've been writing for close to 40 years. I've been teaching for over 30. And one of the things I've really struggled to do, uh, which ties in with what you had said earlier, is I try to take things that are uh, non-rational and complex and take things like dreaming and visionary experience and put them in a way that uh, people can can grasp it no i feel very blessed to have spent all the years i've done going into the jungle mm. and and most people hardly ever get to do any of that so i like to be able to be someone who can translate that experience into an accessible way one of the definitions of shamanism is being a bridge. Absolutely, between the worlds, no? And, and Yes. Yeah, and to translate these experiences is not easy, is it? But no. if you translate them to the best of your ability that people can grasp them, and I tell you, I have quoted you a few times, I know how good you do, how well you are doing. Bless you. <laughs> I, to, I, so, yeah, I have been blessed to be taught, mentored by many famous writers um, mm -hmm. who took me under their wing at a very young age. And as the years go by, I appreciate it more and more. And what I've come to at this point, the key to it all is metaphor. Yes. And, and, and metaphor, as you well know, is one thing that represents something else. Like you can say black is coal. Well, people know what coal is and by looking at it, so that visual, they'll know what the black is and you get, you get the metaphor for what it is. So trying to do that, but it's, uh, it's interesting. I'm, I'm actually on the third draft of my 16th book, um, which is, it's a sequel to my memoir, Spirit Matters. And, it, and it's Spirit Matters chronologically ended in 2020. I mean, I'm sorry, 2000. 2000, so this is, yeah. So this is 20 years later with multiple jungle experiences before it, and I'm learning more and more and more because I want to take those, for lack of better words, uh, intellectual things, and then take the non-rational experiences and, and, and visionary experiences and in dreaming, you have the left and the right brain. And um, the experiences you have are emotional. They're not necessarily rational. There's, there's some rationality in there, but they're very deep and they're very challenging to articulate. So that's been my challenge is to bring that across, you know, in a way through words. Mm. 
And maybe this is what I felt uh, as integrity in a way, because when you describe your experiences, I mean, spirit matter, for example, was fascinated me. Um, your experiences sound very real. It, 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 they sound to me um, as if they are not exaggerated. They're not blown out of all proportion to make yourself look and feel interesting. So, um, therefore, they can actually resonate on quite a deep level. Yes. Um, which, which I found really interesting that they resonated with me and somebody can describe something similar and it doesn't resonate because I can't feel the, the, the person properly. I can, I can almost sense that it's exaggerated, if yes. you know what I mean. And I then, know, absolutely, yeah. And then it becomes, and I think the seeking of truth and you said universal truth, um, and I remember uh, the book you wrote, The Universe is Right Between Your Eyes. Yeah, the center of the universe is right between your eyes, but home is where the heart is. And home is where the heart is, exactly. And uh, that ties in with that idea of that universal truth, which is also absolutely, of course, connected to our own truth as we experience it. Or yes. we can only experience it through ourselves yeah the path is from the head to the heart yeah and you move from being uh in, in my case especially and probably you have probably followed a similar path from being what what Gurdjieff called being intellectually centered yeah uh personality centered to being heart centered and the more I've been on the path the more I've gone to my heart so any integrity that I have is coming through my heart. And when I'm really in the mode and the, and the things are really flowing, um, it comes from there. And, uh, you know, years ago, they, they asked, they did a survey of all the world's geniuses. And I don't think myself a genius or anything of that nature. But the one thing they all had in common is they all said, it, it's not me. It wasn't me. Yeah. Yeah. It worked through me, didn't it? Yes. And when I look back on some of the things I wrote, I, I go, did I write that? Yeah, um, but I wanted to come back uh, a bit to uh, your experiences um, as a visionary and dreamer and your experiences uh, with and without um, the plant medicine you are yeah. taking and you have been taking. Uh, for many years, because also uh, you said you're an explorer, and I think you're also an explorer of these, shall we call it, altered states of consciousness. Um, and um, in a way, to be a visionary and a dreamer, um, you have to be able to let yourself sink into different states don't you to to open up to a completely different functioning of the brain that's correct you you have to be able to surrender yeah surrender. without fully abandoning and i'm i am an aficionado of altered states uh i've tried almost everything I've, i can get my hands on some things you know i'm not going to try crack cocaine uh uh, um, you know, I tried a lot of other things when I was younger, but um, what I discovered, and I'm, it's interesting because I'm, I'm doing this editing on this part of my book right now, is that one aspect of shamanism is learning to navigate yeah. altered states or, or, yeah. or rapidly changing psychological states, if you want to call it that. I mean, you know, we all, whether people realize it or not, we, we're constantly shifting through altered states throughout the day. I mean, if we get up and have a cup of coffee, we're altered. Um, if yeah, somebody makes you course. angry, you're altered. If you're yeah. loving, you know, so that's just a thing. But to take those places and to be able to navigate incomprehensible, non-rational words and keep that bit of, as you, you had mentioned, rationality mm. and maintain what I like to call witness consciousness. Yes, to, that's what it is. Mm. Yeah, then, then to me, you're, what you're actually doing is cultivating awareness. Mm -hmm. And cultivating awareness is another definition of uh, expansion of consciousness. And one of the things I love about it is that it, it never ends. Anybody who tells you that they're enlightened and arrived, you better run from them too. Yeah. 
because every level you reach, there's, there's a whole new set of problems. Integrity becomes even more critical. Yeah. And you are responsible for what you've come to know and come to learn. And, and as you kind of referred to earlier, it gets challenging to really relate to a lot of people because you're coming from a completely different place. You're, you, 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 you start to transcend, I love this, this word paradox, you get to transcend paradox and find your way toward the center, which is very calm. Um, I, I wanna say that um, in, through my research and studies and writing that I discovered that the, uh, the essence of Joseph Campbell's hero's journey is actually the shaman's journey to the underworld, yeah. where in South American shamanism, you get swallowed by the jaguar. You know, Maya, Aztec, you can get you know, decapitated, dismembered, changed. But that essence of that transformative moment where your shadow comes up and swallows you, that is the essence of the hero's journey. And that ties in with archetypes. And archetypes are universal symbolisms. And those are the things I rely on because if you use those universal archetypes um, in the right way, then people such as yourself who are opening their eyes relate because they go, oh yeah, just like metaphor. I get that. I see that. I can relate to that. That's something that I can really uh, get in tune with. And I think when you hit those universals is when you're really starting to reach people. I've discovered is that in shamanism, uh, the perspective is that everything is energy. So um, I love the quote from uh, Hafez. He, he says, um, even after all this time, the sun never once says to the earth, you owe me. Look what happens with a love like that. It lights the whole sky. Mm. So if you look at that, and in shamanism, the heart that is the center of our being is uh, the sun of our unique solar system. And, and in Luxor, Egypt, there is the temple of anthropocosmic man, which is a precise mathematical map of the human body. And they say that um, it is not, not only a map of the human body, but it's a holographic representative of the universe and the cosmos. And in shamanism, the heart within us that is the center of our being is connected to the sun that is the center of our solar system, which is connected to a bigger sun, to a bigger sun, all the way back to source. The thing about the sun is that it gives its energy unconditionally and it shines upon the earth, mother earth, madre tierra, mother and father, you know, pachamama, pachatata, right? And so what fascinates me among other things is that the Amazon, uh, you know, where I go in Peru uh, is just a few degrees off of the equator. Mm. Well, that's the place where the sun hits the earth the most out of any place else on the planet. And that's where you have the greatest, most intense, focused intensity and diversity of life is there. So, you right. know, that in and of itself, and mm. now they, 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 they call ayahuasca the mother of, the, of all the other plants. And I've worked with numerous plants now, all related working with ayahuasca. And I've worked with other ones in the Andes and in, and, you know, in the Southwest and I've done the whole peyote pilgrimage and all of that. But the point is that that unconditional giving energy hits the earth right in the middle where the most diverse life is. And that is where for me um, in my ayahuasca experiences um, to me, Ayahuasca is the voice of Mother Earth that speaks to me in many, many ways. And I'm to the point now where if I never took another substance ever, I'm fine. I don't need anything. Um, I'm in a constant state of integration, or as I like to say, I'm constantly altered. Yeah, 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 yeah. But I still continue because I'm now to the point where my mentors are aging and passing, and I'm carrying the torch, and I still benefit. But you know, for all the years when I've done it in the jungle uh, with, with the, the leaders down there, I've always just taken a full dose or more and gone for it. But of course, when I'm leading, I'll take, I'm a kamikaze. Um, I, I usually take about a quarter of a dose. So I'm in the zone, but, yeah. but when I'm leading a ceremony, I am fully responsible for everybody in that ceremony. So I yeah. need to be able to navigate that awareness and I can navigate it now because I've got all these years of experience of navigating. Yeah, 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 yeah. You know, so the things that have happened to me in ayahuasca, I've gone through things in my visions. 
And then they happened to me later in my life, you know, days, weeks, a couple of years later. And I don't think I would have survived some of those events if I hadn't have gone through them um, in, in the ayahuasca visions first. Mm. So I've learned through the ayahuasca and the other plants in many, many ways. And, and so in the jungle dietas, uh, dreaming and visions flow into each other. And in indigenous cultures, there's, there's no difference between sleeping and waking and dreaming and visions. It's all the same. It's just a continuum. It's all one reality, but you're navigating different states of consciousness or different realms or worlds, whatever you want to call them, spirits, but you're navigating them. And when you learn to navigate and you uh, gain that flexibility, it, it gets intense in the jungle, but your dreams and your visions uh, and your waking all become the same. And so the dreams start flowing into the visions, the visions flow into the dreams. And of course, those start to flow into your everyday life. And then your everyday quote unquote waking consciousness becomes more magical and more fluid and more navigatable. And, and your perception expands because you can navigate uh, stressful situations. Yeah, yeah, so, yeah, yeah. Mm. You know, there, there's a freedom in that that comes from that, and it is a hard-won freedom. So um, the joy, in fact, the, the picture behind me is my Tombow. I've, I've been in other places, but that's where I've spent most of my 10 years. Uh, it used to have a thatched roof. I don't like the tin roof, but uh, that's the way it is. But um, in, in all those years, I've really, really become aware of how everything is connected. Mm. And now everything, whether a plant or an animal or an insect or whatever, are all just different types of consciousness. And no matter what happens in the external world or the internal world, where it comes through us, how we interpret it and what we make of it constitutes reality as we all know it. And right. it's a little bit different for, for, uh, for everyone. But I, I believe... Um, you know, you and I, in many ways, are kindred spirits. We've, we've taken different paths, but um, all paths lead to Rome. And now you and I and others like us, uh, people who, who are listening to this or watching this, um, start to recognize that we're all tuning in to the same vibe, the same, I like to think of it as a cosmic wave. To come back to what you said, which um, interests me in this connection, this... Um the sacredness of life, of land, of nature, of everything, basically. Um, about what you said, that you learned that everything is connected. And I feel, uh, from what I have experienced, also not just with plant medicine, generally speaking, once we begin to really experience that, that everything is connected. Um, yes. It, that produces quite a shift, doesn't it, in us? Do you feel that? Yeah, so it's what I like to refer to as uh, holographic, which I, uh, which I mentioned earlier. If anybody knows anything about a hologram, one of the things about a hologram is that you can take the image and cut it up into bunches of smaller pieces and the whole image is contained within yeah. each piece. Yeah. So I see, you know, one of the things... When, when you and I first connected, uh, I didn't know you at all, but I, I read your book on shamanism and I was like, wow, she gets it. Wow, she totally gets it. And I, I like you said with me, I resonated with you. I was like, okay, she, she really gets it. Mm. And one of the things that I've discovered among others is the whole aspect of what I refer to as shamanic mirroring, uh, which ties in with shadow work. So um, any, anything... Anything that drives you nuts in another person is your shadow. Mm -hmm. and, that, and that part of you is projecting onto that so that you won't see it. And of course, we created our shadows and it's a defense mechanism. So they're really trying their best in their own ways to try to help us. Mm -hmm. But when you start to see that and then you know you, something you may have judged somebody for before and then it becomes revealed to you, whether in an ayahuasca vision or a dream or a situation, and suddenly you go, oh my God, that's me. Yeah, yeah. And then you shift, and you shift from being judgmental to being compassionate. 
And compassion is the gift you get for facing the darkness. Yeah. Part of you know the whole experience and the sacredness of it. Uh, ayahuasca, I know you know this, ayahuasca in shamanism is considered the dark feminine. Yeah. And you, the more you face the darkness and the fear, the more you get rewarded with the gift that's hidden in there. And with that gift becomes uh, the compassion and compassion is expansive. Yeah, so yeah. if you really- That's the heart centeredness, isn't it? Ab absolutely. The, more, the, more, the gift is in the end, I think, being centered in the yes. heart. Then, yeah, yeah then, then you're understanding and you're empathic. And in, 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 in some respects, it comes down to sort of two things. Fear is contraction and love is expansion. Yeah, it is that kind of, um, and it's not necessarily psychological. I think it is also the more you expand who you know you are, that you are part of a much bigger whole, that you are one speck in that web, um, then these things become also are put into perspective. Yes. You're, yes, you're, you're, you're yeah. Go ahead. Mm. But no, you're a drop of water in the ocean and you're the ocean. And you're the ocean, no? And, and, it, on the whole, you are the drop, but you're also the ocean because you That's are right. everything there is. That's right. And you are within that everything, there is a drop. Yeah. And I think that is um, what you say, um, you, you define it as, as um, overcoming dualism in a way, isn't it? Absolutely. Absolutely. Because, you know, the other thing, shamanism is called the power path. And if you think of uh, a pendulum swinging as an example, when you get to the highest, the right-hand swing of the pendulum at the highest point, at that point where it reverses energy, it loses. There is no energy in that, in that momentary shift from one direction to the other. When you swing toward the middle, the maximum power and energy is in the middle. Mm. And, and then when you go back to the other extreme, you, you lose energy until you get to that transition point of going back toward the middle. So the power is in the middle. And if you look at any phenomenon in nature, like, like a, a hurricane, what happens in the middle of a hurricane? Nothing. Illness, yeah. Illness. Yeah. And mm -hmm. that's the place that, that we all have to strive for, uh, in my humble opinion, to, to find uh, that, that mindfulness and that awareness and that centeredness to be able to be in the midst of chaos and yet, be a, a grounded and at peace, you know, with yourself. Mm. Um, you know, one of the things I, I, I like to think about in the jungle with the ayahuasca is I, I for me, those experiences and those diets um, are you're getting a tour from the jungle from the inside out and the outside in. You're experiencing it externally and internally. And yeah. you really do become the jungle. Yeah. And then you do realize the sacredness of all life and you realize how the bugs feed the, the frogs and the frogs feed the snakes and the jaguars eat the snakes and then they die and um, all the bacteria eat them. And I mean, it's just an endless cycle of life and yeah. you find yourself existing uh, within it and part of it, really part of it. And then you have a deep appreciation for how the wonderfulness of uh, nature and how it all balances out and, uh, the true sacredness of it. And this is something indigenous people have always known through, mm. through living within it. You know, they would settle in a place and they would cultivate a bit and do their thing for a couple of years and hunt and gather. And when that gets worn out, they would move maybe 20 miles away to a new camp and then do the same thing. And they would do the whole thing and they would go in a circle. And after maybe 20 years, they get back to the original place. And of right. course, it's back to where it was. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I <laughs> I love that you say that because um, I was thinking about this um, a bit earlier. I don't know where I read this story, but there is a story, you know, that um, some Western person um, is with a tribe and um, the tribe, I don't know if I read it in one of your books or somewhere else, but the tribe has for, for a long time walked the same path to a hunting ground, which was the 
best way and the easiest way to get to that hunting ground. And then one day they suddenly use another pass and the person um, uh, says to the, to the chief, so why are you using another pass now? And the chief says, um, because the pass told us. And the person is very confused and says, how can the past tell you? And the chief just looks at him and says, um, have a look, the flowers are not coming back. And it is that I've never forgotten this story because of course you can walk a certain way again and again for years and plants will always come back but then there comes a point when they don't when you have pushed them too much into the ground and they and it was this simple the past told us so because we are actually connected to it why yeah. for us in our no not for us but in the normal kind of more western orientated uh um they, we would have not spotted it, or if we would have spotted it, we would have said, all right, that's, that's great, you know, the path is now much easier to navigate because nothing is growing on it any longer. And I, I love that story because it's, it ties in with what you just said, that everything is connected. And if I'm respecting that, if I really understand that, then I realize the path is talking to me and if I talk back to it and say, okay, I'm not walking you anymore for a year or two, so you can recover, it's a bit like your tribe. They move away and then they come back once it has recovered. Yeah, interesting. Is this is where they, they just understand that very, yeah. very deep. And this is how, what I would call treating life as being sacred and that is all of life this is yep. the smallest plant to the little insect because you understand that it's all connected yeah we're, we're all connected and interdependent so I, I nothing i say is original I, I probably stole something somewhere somehow but one of the things about rudolf steiner that i loved he was talking about if you so we we uh, exhale carbon dioxide the plants take it in and give yep. us oxygen yep. well if you if you look at our lungs and then you look at a tree yep. the tree is our lungs inside out absolutely right? oh yeah how similar is that yeah yeah we reproduce sort of from the bottom the trees reproduce from the top yeah right we eat from the top they eat from the bottom i mean the complementary thing you know and then, you know, when I started to really realize the what I consider to be an innate intelligence in ayahuasca and other plants, um, it really opened my eyes. You know, who's who's really smarter? Uh, mm. you know, and then if we respect all life, whether plant or animal, mm. they're all the same. Um, they're just different levels of conscious awareness. And, and there's, there's always more and there's always less. And, be, you know, uh, who knows what a plant really thinks? But, yeah, we don't. Uh, we don't, but we know more now, don't we? We know we we know much more now how um, they they kind of that for example trees that they communicate with such a, with other true root networks and so on. Yeah. And yes, I'm absolutely with you about consciousness. Uh, it is just different levels of consciousness. And who says that we have the highest level? Well, we say so, and that can yeah. be also disputed. I, I'm interested in that, um, what you said, that everything has consciousness. You want to elaborate? Yeah, I mean, you know, if you think about it, even going back to what I said about uh, fear is contraction um, and love is expansion, if you poke something at a one-celled one animal in some way, it's going to react. It's survival. And then the way that we, we have developed as humans you know, we have the inner reptilian brain, which is pure sort of instinct and survival. And then there's the, the uh, mammalian brain on top of that, where you start to get into nurturing. 
yeah. and a little, you know, warm bloodedness. And then of course the human, I think that's, I think they call that the neomammalian brain. Um, then you have the ability to make more, uh, for lack of better words, uh, conscious decisions. But anything that responds, if you go back to the whole concept of energy, anything that responds to energy is showing intelligence and intelligence is consciousness. So if you take a seed and put it in the ground and it gets the right amount of nurturing with water, um, sunlight, it's gonna grow. Mm, mm. Uh, you know, it, and, and it's going to respond. And so different plants, depending on their locations, will respond in different ways, right? Mm. Some better than others. Some are healthier than others. There's nitrogen in the soil in a particular way. And the pH of the soil is a particular way. This plant is going to respond. And the way that life adapts to environments is pure intelligence. And the fact that it responds to stimulus to survive and thrive is intelligence. It's why, in my humble opinion, that people go on and on about all this artificial intelligence stuff. But to me, the essence is the spark of life. And the spark of life is that spark of what I like to think of as cosmic intelligence that every living thing has in one way or another. Right. And when we, re we recognize that, and whether it's in an ant or in myself, if I look at the ant and go, okay, its perspective, its horizon is maybe two feet above the ground and its whole world is maybe two feet above the ground and you know a few feet around it or whatever, but that's the limits of its perception. And then we look at ourselves in terms of the greater cosmos. We are that whole cliche of nothing more sort of than dust in the wind, but we're intelligent. Mm -hmm. And there's always gonna be something bigger and always gonna be something smaller, but it really doesn't matter because that spark of divine, divine spark of life yeah, yeah, yeah. isn't it all? Yeah, so yeah. You, that also you know, creates that incredible variety. Yeah, and which with it, which is with its absolute beauty, stunning beauty. This variety, it's 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 quite unbelievable, actually. If you think about it, it is quite unbelievable, isn't it? The, oh, the, yeah, it's mind blowing. It's, it's literally mind blowing, especially in the jungle when you're seeing it outside of yourself and then yeah. you're seeing whole other realms inside of yourself. Yeah. You know, and perspectives that are prior to those experiences really unimaginable, you know, and, and, and truly magical and truly supernatural. Mm. Um, and, and then you get to see, for lack of better words, the bigger picture. And I think you go deep into the microcosm which also brings you into the macrocosm it's and you realize it's all reflections, reflections yeah. within reflections within reflections. It's infinite um, and it's beautiful. It's like, you know, millions of sparkling multicolored jewels um, mm. with colors that we don't normally see in our normal perception. And to me, they're all gifts and they're uh, archetypal messages that are showing us the bigger picture. You know, one of the things I've come to realize is that geometry is a universal language. Yes, you wrote about that quite a bit, which kind of blew my mind. Um, <laughs> and it is interesting that uh, many people call it, of course, a sacred geometry. Yes. And it, do, do you feel sometimes that we, we actually haven't got the words for it. We, we, the, the only words which do come to us is divine or sacred. It's just so astonishing, so mind blowing. Yeah, it's, I always like to tell the story. Years ago, I went into a spiritual bookstore in Los Angeles and I walked in on a lecture and some Indian girl kind of guy said, he started the lecture and he said, uh, you have come here and asked me to speak of God, but I'm sorry that I cannot do that because as soon as I open my mouth, I'm lying. Because anything I say is restrictive and can't even begin to grasp the yeah. awesome expansiveness of it. It's why I always love to say, that, you know, I'm probably repeating myself here, but you never arrive. Um, no, I agree with you fully there. And it is, um, I think it's one of these human, um, 
traits that we think, we think that we are at a point where we can actually grasp what the arriving means or what enlightenment is. We cannot because we are not there. We can still expand, expand, expand consciousness and there will be more and more. And yeah, so, I, therefore, yeah. we, we, we cannot uh, um, define what arriving means because then we... Um, set a limit to something which is, as you say, infinite. And to me, one of the things about shamanism is that it's based on experiential knowledge. Yeah, yeah. You know, you, you can, Jesus, I, I, I sometimes upset Christians. I, I say to them, you know, I guarantee you, if you go into the desert and you fast for 40 days and 40 nights, you'll be talking to God too. You know, Jesus went into the desert, Muhammad See, went into the yeah. cave. Absolutely. Right? Buddha said under a tree. Tree, right. Yeah. And, yeah. and so, you know, mm -hmm. people will read their experiences and somebody else will write it down and then somebody else will translate it and somebody will translate that and redefine it. And by the time you get to scripture, you're a gazillion times removed from the actual experience. And so shamanism and shamans say the hell with all that. You go into the desert. You have your experience. That's where it's at. It gives you that, it asks you to experience and to kind of build your knowing and not knowledge, your knowing through experience. And I think yeah. that's really important, an important point because only if you experience something, can you really connect to it properly. Yeah, I, I agree. I mean, like I could be sitting here right now having a divine revelation from the cosmos and nobody would know. You know, one of the things that drove me nuts when I was initially studying anthropology is they go, yeah, you know, uh, these people sit around and they drink this ugly looking plant mixture and, you know, they're pooping their pants and they're vomiting and they're screaming and yelling. It just makes them crazy, right? Yet the person in the middle of that experience, because it's it's entirely subjective, is having a blissful experience. So they're learning something or they're seeing things that they've denied all their life or whatever it happens to be, it's always subjective. One of my favorite expressions that I stole somewhere is uh, radical subjectivity. Mm, mm. You know, it's why I say the center of the universe is right between your eyes, but home is where the heart is because that's that that's the path, but it's all subjective. But you know, isn't it interesting that when you just mentioned uh, Jesus and the 40 uh, days in the desert, um, yeah. it is really interesting that all the people we revere in a way, we, 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 we made them huge, had mm -hmm. to go through the dark. Yeah, every one and of them. And all that you have to experience the light and the dark in order to see the big picture and okay and and that brings me to something else because it both exists and it has to exist together yeah you can't the, the, the darker it is the lighter the light is and vice versa they do have to exist and you cannot have one without the other if, if you if, exactly. if everything was all light there would be nothing all light is the same as all dark. If there's no contrast, there's no definition of anything. And, and, and if you think of the essence of what energy is, energy is polarity. Mm. It's, you know, it's, it's a positive and a negative. And in the shamanism, and, and they're equal. Not Negative isn't any different than positive. Mm -hmm. You know, like, like the feminine is considered negative and the masculine is considered positive not in any derogatory way. They're equal and each have their own gifts to bring to the party. Well, but the more I create the energy, as yeah. you said. I mean, the, the fullest energy you have if they both are in yeah. mm. Right. And they're both um, heading toward the middle where there's, yeah. the, you know, the, the maximum power is, is there in the middle. Mm. So if we talk consciousness and that everything is conscious, so how do you treat everything if everything is conscious? Well, you know, it gets back to what I said earlier. If you look at it, everything is energy. 
Yeah, so you, you go on to an energetic level, yeah. Yeah, think, think about this. If you look at the table of elements, hydrogen is at the top, mm. and the next element is helium, mm. right? Those are the highest vibration mm. that we know of in matter. And of course, as you go down to the table of elements, it gets increasingly dense. Well, guess what? The sun is hydrogen and helium. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's pure energy. And that's yeah. coming into existence. Um, without going, hopefully not too much off on a tangent here, but this has been bubbling in the back of my head during our, our little chat here. If, if, you, if you're going back to geometry for a moment, a point has no dimension. To me, a point is the first manifestation of physical physicality into spirit. And in terms of expanding consciousness, to me, uh, it expands as a spiral. A spiral is based on the golden mean, which is the core and essence of sacred geometry, and everything goes off of that. Now, if you take a point and you move it, so there's an energetic movement of a point in one direction, the next thing you have is a line, which is considered the first dimension. If you were to exist within the first dimension, then all you would see is points. Yeah, right, I if get you, that. So you move the line and you have a plane, which is the second dimension. And if you exist within a plane, all you see is lines. If you move the line again, and this is all energetic movement, by the way, from the beginning, from the point of beginning, you move the plane to three dimensional cube and you exist within three dimensions and all you see is two dimensions. So that makes us four dimensional beings. And you have to be in the dimension above to perceive the dimension below. Yeah, yeah. So I consider that one of my models for consciousness expansion. And when you begin to get outside of quote unquote, three dimensional thinking, you start to see things from a higher perspective. And a lot of the things, you know, for me, the chaos that we're experiencing right now, individually and collectively, is chaos that precedes rebirth. Um, and so to go through all that chaos to come into a new place is because the old paradigms no longer work anymore. And they have to break down because the container can't hold, those restrictions can't hold what's, what's going on inside of it. Yeah. And then you begin to get outside. And a lot of the talk, the Hopis talk about the fifth world or the fifth dimension yeah. or you yeah. know, all of that stuff, right? Yeah, I start to see it that way. And so the perspective that's been evolving within me makes it harder and harder for me to relate to people. Um, so when I really see things, and then you even look at, you know, the way they say that 98% of matter is empty or whatever, and all of the Newtonian physics go off the rails when you get into the quantum physics. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's still to me, it's always the unfolding, the great mystery. And I'm embracing the mystery and the fact that I don't know everything and don't know anything makes it all that much more exciting for me because it's infinite and it continues to unfold. And the more I get outside the box, which is one of the things I was certainly puts you, it's outside the box. Yeah. Uh, and, the, and, you know, and the other plants too, respectfully, um, the more you get outside of that, the more you get to see things. This, um, the shift of paradigm, just um, a last bit. Um, yeah. Now, what we usually see as a shift in paradigm is because the old view of how things are and how we understood things, too many bits fall outside. So we need to shift the way we see the world. So it's a shift in consciousness, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Yes. And you just said you feel this is happening. Do you feel this is kind of predestined or... Well, I'm really interested me, in that because yeah, let me. So to me, it, it's an evolutionary process. Yeah, and in order to grow and expand without becoming stagnant, you have to, in some way, get outside the box. Yeah, you know, if you think of the the spiral I was talking about, yeah. even with plants, there's they call phylotaxis, which is the plants, the leaves come out at specific points on the spiral that follow the Fibonacci sequence in order to get the most energy and the most light. Yeah. So, so it's through that uh, spiral that they grow. 
So to me, it's the evolution of consciousness. And another one of my models I love to give is um, cymatics. I don't know if you're familiar with cymatics or not. No. C it's C-Y-M-A-T-I-C-S. And it was pioneered by a gentleman by the name of Hans Jenny. I think he was German. And I think it was in the 30s. Lots of them. So, yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what happens in cymatics is, uh, as one example, they'll take a plate and they'll put a very fine powder on there, like they were using lycodium spores. And they would run a particular frequency through that plate. And they would form into a mandala, a dynamic moving oh, mandala yeah. pattern. Oh, yeah, I have seen this. No, I know about it. Yes, I have seen right. that. Yeah, yeah. Mm. So if you increase the frequency, yeah. that mandala will dissolve into chaos. Yeah. And then if you continue to increase it, it will form into a higher, more complex mandala-like structure. I've seen that, yeah, yeah. So okay. that is one of my, my models for the expansion and evolution of consciousness. And if you follow, for lack of better words, geometric progression or geometric expansion through starting with the point and you follow it through, that's the path. Right. And it continues infinitely. And then it gets, you know, it goes so far out, it gets in and it's holographic and it's in and out. And, you know, you experience bilocation and other things and, and telepathy and uh, other wonderful experiences because it's proof that in time and space, in many respects, are human constructs. And they're limited within our perceptions so we can yeah. comprehend the reality that we're in. Yeah. But just because that's what comprehend that's only a glimpse. That's maybe less than 1%. Who knows? It goes on, which is one of the really beautifully awesome, wonderful things about the great mystery. For me, it just ties in with this divine and sacred that we have to accept that this is a great mystery. And whether yeah. we will ever be able to explore it completely, I don't believe it. I, but we will get much, much further. But it is yeah. a great mystery. And um, that is also exciting, isn't it? Oh, totally. It's, it's, it's thrilling. Yeah, it is thrilling. And life is thrilling because, because we are able to, to immerse ourselves in, in it and explore it more and more and expand more and more and, and see uh, what it is actually about. Why is it astonishing that we know very little? Mm. Yeah, what a what a gift, what a blessing. I I wanted to one more question while I'm recording. Um, I wanted to ask you that. So, your plant medicine experiences, except especially ayahuasca, was that mainly in Peru, or did, or do you feel the same effects if you just take it somewhere else? I wanted to come back to place because that um, yeah. that idea of how important place and energies and setup and so on is. Do you think it is important? What's your experience? There's two sides to that question. Um, one thing that fascinated me about ayahuasca in particular is an agreed upon psychological landscape. So you can do ayahuasca in the jungle and you can do it in New York City and people will still experience jaguars and snakes mm. and mm. condors and other things. Mm. The archetype and the imagery is the same no matter where you are, it doesn't matter. I get it, yep. But when you're in the jungle and you're in its home base environment, yeah. and particularly when you're doing shamanic plant diets over a you know, 10 day period where it's a very restricted diet and you're also working with another number of plants that work in conjunction with it. Um, it's a completely different experience because you're going for an extended period of time. You don't have quote unquote, any normal routine. You're not getting up every morning at seven mm. o'clock or six o'clock to go to work. Mm. You could be sleeping half the day and you can be up all night your mm. dreams, your visions, those experiences all flow into each other. And these different plants uh, work on you in different ways. So in my beginning years, I was working with, I would be drinking, you know, ayahuasca roughly every other night. 
So you do five ceremonies and one picture of a plant every day. And as the years have gone on, now they, they have me doing five ceremonies, you know, ceremony every other night, two experiences alone in my tambo. And then now they're giving me sometimes five or six different plants, a picture of those every day. Mm. And the experiences are broadening and I'm getting more and more um, insights and they grow. So there's a difference between doing ayahuasca in one ceremony and doing three ceremonies in a yeah, row. Yeah, yeah. Right? Then, and yeah. then there's doing seven ceremonies over 10 days with other plants. So you have, uh, even like in writing fiction or whatever, you have an arc of one ceremony, you have an arc of three ceremonies, five ceremonies. And I've discovered that over all these years, which is now more than 20 years, um, that there are bigger arcs that go sometimes for years. And sometimes I'll experience something in a ceremony or a vision that was connected with something from eight years ago that I hadn't seen before. Mm. So there's a bigger arc. Mm. So um, to me, it's always better in its home environment, uh, more intense and all that. And you can stick closer to the diet. The closer you st stick to the, the diet and the quote unquote rules and regulations, the more intense and thorough and deep the experience you're going to have. Yeah. But if you're in another place, for argument's sake, New York City, you're still going to have experiences. You're just yeah, not yeah, going to yeah. get, you know, to the depth. So it's kind of a two-sided question. No, I, yeah, I wanted to um, get the idea whether there is a difference in quality. And I guess there is, as you say. And also it depends, of course, how much you take and with other plants together. But the quality of the environment in a way plays into the experience because you're on home ground of the plant. Yeah, and you're with, you know, so in, in my reality and in shamanism, the word spirit and the, the word energy are really the same thing. Yeah, yeah. So if within, you're in the environment- in the, Within an energy field, aren't you? Yeah. That's, exactly, that's, exactly. Yeah, morphogenetic field, if, if you want to get a little technical there with Rupert yeah, Sheldrake's yeah. Uh, morphogenetic field. Con um, creates the ideal container for the plant medicine ceremony. Yeah, so like if I was going to take you on a ceremony and we went to some place, wherever, uh, we could have the experience. Great. But if I had the experience with you in my home with all my accoutrements and all my things around me, energetically speaking, yeah, uh, particularly in the jungle where it's the plants, then you are within those energy fields and you really do become part of them. You I know, understand that. Yeah. I mean, yeah. Maybe I'm, I'm asking you that because I knew, I knew it would be like this, but I wanted to hear it from yeah. you as well. Um, because of course, coming back to this idea, all the way back to the sacred lands and sacred sites, um, the energy of place contributes to whatever it is you experience. Absolutely. If, if, if you go back to the whole male, female archetype, where the sun is the male, yeah, hitting the earth at the point where it hits it the most, and the earth is the feminine or the egg, yeah. And you know, without getting kinky, you, you think of uh, the sun as as like the sperm and the yeah. uh, the earth as the egg. Yeah, yeah. You are at the point of conception. Yeah, yeah and yeah. you're being spoken to. In my reality, you're being spoken to by the nurturing voice of Mother Earth. Of Mother Earth, yeah, yeah. And you are being held in the greatest concentration of life on the whole planet, mm. where there's the greatest amount of water and the greatest amount of sun, you know, the masculine and feminine elephants. I had a shaman tell me years ago, and I love this analogy. Um, he said, every time it rains, Mother Earth is inhaling. Mm. And I thought, yeah, mm -hmm. because what are you doing? You're bringing in life. Yeah, of course you're bringing in life. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and you know, and H2O, right? Well, there's hydrogen mm. and the oxygen, right? And that's why we 
have to kind of almost speak in metaphor, don't we? Because that yeah. is beautiful and everybody will instantly understand it. What's more sacred than the essence of life? Yeah. Which is birth. And as we've, we've touched on here and there, the fact that um, life in and of itself is the sacred intelligence of what is sacred. And here you are in the womb, yeah, 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 yeah. getting fertilized mm. and submitting yourself you know, to that. There, there's an expression called whistling through the forest. You know, when you sing the Icaros to the plants, yeah. Yeah. you're flattering them. Yeah, yeah. You're the most beautiful thing, um, you know? That ever was, yeah. Ever, infinitely. And it and, nurtures them, doesn't it? Of oh, they, they're it's like, oh, yeah, you're paying attention to me. Yeah, yeah. And, and, and this whole concept, you know, it's like a woman. She gets all dressed up and prettied up and puts on her makeup and dresses up. And, you, and, and the guys are like, whoa, check her out, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, you're getting attention, right? And, and okay. not only with the, the plants and the animals, but I've had a, numerous experiences now with elemental spirits overall mm. that when they get recognized, they respond. And I got to tell you, there's a few times they really freaked me out. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I love getting freaked out. That's a, 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 you know, it's a big part yeah, of it. Because that's what it's about, isn't it, in a way? Because that yeah. expands your connection. Yeah. Of course and it then, does. Of course and, it does. And, and, yeah, and you're alive. So when you do this concept of whistling in the forest, you're basically going in and you're saying, look, I'm coming into your house. I know you're here. I know you're the boss. And I know you, you can heal me and you can kill me. Yeah, yeah. And I want you to know that I'm acknowledging you and I'm giving myself to you with the trust and the honor and the respect of the sacredness that you are. Mm. And, I'm, and I'm basically giving myself to you in many respects and sacrificing myself to you. You know, one of the things I've come to the realization of personally is that my body is, is my temple. Even though I don't always treat it the best, um, I'm pretty good most of the time. But everything that I put into my mouth, I consider it to be an offering to divinity. And they, in the jungle, they call ayahuasca the medicine. Well, medicine doesn't taste good. No, no. And you may get plunged into hell for a while, but that's what it takes to cure you and heal you. And when you submit to that and really mm -hmm. surrender to it and, and, and acknowledge the fact that it represents uh, powers and energies that are far more powerful than you are and you get rewarded mm -hmm. and you get rewarded on multiple levels that just it's the gift that keeps on giving it never stops it's that whole infinite thing again what's more sacred than that yeah absolutely right?